One of the greatest challenges facing the church, the home, and youth ministry today is the need for effective Christian nurture and discipleship that will lead kids to a deep faith that informs all of life for the rest of their lives. One necessary component in these ministry efforts is to welcome and answer the kinds of doubts and questions teenagers express about Christianity. Dark Room is a brand new series of free videos and support resources marked by quality and production and content designed to be used by church and home to spark deep and meaningful conversations about the issues kids face today. Stick with us as I chat with Darkroom content creator Mary Jo Sharp about this free new evangelism and discipleship resource on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, this is Youth Culture Matters. If you're a parent, youth worker, educator, counselor, grandparent, or anyone else who cares about kids, we're glad you've joined us for this practical, informative, and hope-filled podcast. This is a place where together we talk and think Christianly about the rapidly changing world of today's children, teens, and young adults. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Youth Culture Matters. I'm Walt Mueller here at CPYU. We're glad you've joined us. Uh, I usually remind people of this when we finish up, but I'll just say it on the front end that we are grateful for all of you who listen and for those of you who are communicating with others about our Youth Culture Matters podcast. Please continue to do that. And I know you hear this all the time. Any podcast you listen to, you hear people say, you know, like us, subscribe us, give a good review. That helps. And the fact of the matter is it does. So uh, if you would do that, that would be really helpful. I'm excited about a conversation we're going to have today because it it really is about uh, some valuable resources. Uh, We're going to be talking to Mary Jo Sharp. Uh, She is a good, valuable resource for those of us who love teenagers and young adults and are working with kids in the church, and then also uh, those of us who are parents who care about communicating our faith to our kids. But in addition to her being a great resource for us, and, and we'll talk about Uh, a lot of what she's written and what she's working on. Uh, She's a part of another resource that has launched recently, and it's this particular resource that led us to reach out to her. It's a series of apologetics videos that are done very, very well called uh, Dark Room, and we're going to talk a bit more about that and how to access those. Uh, We are always looking for good resources, especially in the world of youth ministry, And I'm just going to be honest, after all my decades in youth ministry, I'm always a little, just you have to prove to me that it's good, because a lot of times we put out things that aren't uh, quality, and and this is quality, quality stuff, so I can't recommend it highly enough, Uh, but we're going to talk with Mary Jo about that. She'll talk more about that in a little bit. So Mary Jo, welcome. Uh, I understand you're, you're joining us from Portland. Yes, I am. That's where um, I'm finally back here after years of being uh, in Texas. Okay. And uh, let me ask you about Portland. You know, I, just a question. I always I always love to pick the brain of people in the Pacific Northwest as to how it's different from the rest of the country, particularly for those of us here in uh, the Northeast. We have a friend who's in Spokane, Washington, and he often wears a hat that says, uh, it's a baseball cap that says, upper left. And so we get into these arguments about which which part of the country is a better place to live in, you know, upper left or upper right. And it's all it's all in good fun. But, um, you know, specifically, you know, tell us a little bit about the culture of Portland, because we're culture watchers here and we love that. Yeah, um, it's a it's a culture where it's a little bit more um, and has been for some time a little bit more post-Christian. Um, there's you can look up studies about like the non religious participation in Oregon uh, itself, you know, as far back as the sixties. And it's just a place where, you know, and I'm going to speak out of my own experience. I haven't done a lot of like sociological study on this, but it's just a place where uh, religion is more private. It's more of a private matter than when I lived in the South where I encountered so many people like they went to church, almost everybody I knew had a church background and, or they went, you know, or their dad was a pastor or uncle or so, you know, they had, they had some kind of understanding of church and uh, growing up, I didn't. And so I tell people, um, Oregon is different from Texas in that we don't have a gas station, nor a Tex-Mex restaurant, nor a church on every street corner. So that kind of <laughs> typifies, yeah. you know, a big difference there culturally. And um, yeah, I, I think it's it's more, you have to like sort of 
build this relational capital with people in order to have these kind of harder conversations because some of the conversations that we just throw around in the south are a little considered a little bit more private up here and and as you say that uh, i'm interested in how that plays into your own personal story because yours is one of deconstruction and then seeing the lord rebuild your faith which has led to what you're doing now so um, maybe the first part of my question is, can you talk about your story, your own personal story, and then you know, d- d- build a bridge then to what you're doing now? Because I, I want folks to hear specifically about the unique ministry that, that you're involved in with apologetics. Yeah, definitely. So that was, you know, my upbringing was in sort of this culture where it wasn't overtly Christian, like when I was in the South. And um, so I grew up in a home that we um, didn't go to church. I didn't have a Christian upbringing, but what I did have was uh, parents who really loved science, nature, and the arts, and and did a lot with me as far as uh, taking me to concerts and musicals and plays. And uh, my dad loved to take me outside to watch meteor showers and watch science shows with me. So what I think um, they did develop in me was a wonder at the universe in which I lived. And so as I got older, I began to ask more questions about is this all there is? Uh, is there anything else out there in the universe? Like I started asking philosophical questions. And as I was getting older in um, high school, I had a music teacher who was a Christian and he felt burdened for me. So when I was about to graduate from high school, he gave me a Bible and said, when you go off to college, you're going to have hard questions. I hope you'll turn to this. So I actually went off to college to investigate faith which is funny because that's the opposite story that we hear so much of. I went off to see what it was about and started attending churches on my own. And um, at a church where I was, I was invited to a certain church where I heard a gospel presentation and like everything started to make sense to me. I had, I had actually read that Bible. He gifted me. um, And I went off to college and that was where it all came together. And I trusted Jesus for my salvation, but I started to notice after I got into the church, um, even from the very first day that I was going into church to profess that I had accepted Christ as my savior, I noticed a lot of judgmentalism. Um, I noticed a lack of the sort of the things that drew me to Christ, um, like his great beauty uh, that I saw throughout the universe and the arts. Um, I noticed that there was attention to things that were not, you know, the things that drew me to Christ, like his uh, an attention there's an anti-intellectualism there was uh, so not an attention to the knowledge of god and anyway so what i what i experienced in the church was sort of this hypocrisy that i saw you know i i started to ask do these people even believe what they say they believe and then that <laughs> came back to myself and i went wait a minute why do i believe this what why did i say i trusted in jesus do I even know, you know, do I, why do I say I trust the Bible? Do I, do I know if Jesus rose from the dead? How do I know any of these things? And that sort of launched me into a search uh, for answers. And at that point, didn't know apologetics was a field of study. And I stumbled across uh, Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. And that opened up a whole bunch of scholars to me, which eventually I found a degree program in apologetics. And now I'm a professor of apologetics and that was the connection to this current project. Mm. And then when you hear that story, you're, going, you're always going like, okay, what's the next chapter after professor <laughs> of apologetics, right? So the, um, so the, when you went through a period, I know you've talked about this before, a period of deconstruction, was that what you just described? Or was there something beyond that period? You know, what happened in that, you know, in terms of the kinds of questions you were asking? Because I'm... I really am, um, there's a couple things you said that really struck me. The one was what the music teacher said to you when he put the Bible in your hand. That was just absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, how, how did he say that again? Take this with you. You might need it. You'll have questions. When you go off to college, you're going to yeah. have hard questions. I hope you'll turn to this. Oh, man, that is just like, I, and I wish... I wish I could think of things like that. You know, it's, I'm normally going, take this, read it now, because you're going to be really messed up if you don't. But I think that's just a brilliant thing. And then uh, the, the other thing you mentioned was just your, you know, the way you were introduced with your family into the beauty of things and the majesty of God or the majesty of the universe, you know, which ultimately led you uh, to, to the Lord. And so 
I'm thinking, was there a, was there a time in there where uh, where there was kind of a blip and you went backwards into into deconstructing what it was you'd experienced first as a believer? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great clarifying question. I um, yeah. So I when I was reading. I didn't even say I read that Bible before I became a Christian. And that's, that is what happened. Like I read that Bible, went off to college, started investigating church and faith more. Um, and yeah, so what happened to me is as I began to see sort of this hypocritical attitude that was prevalent in the church, I'm not saying somebody did one thing to me once and then I, it blew up my faith. It was a pattern of behaviors I saw. Uh, and especially as my husband and I began to get involved in ministry, I met my husband young in college and, um, he got involved with youth ministry because we were both education majors and we loved kids. And so um, this pattern of behaviors, what it did was it started to uh, produce an, like an emotional doubt in me uh, because I couldn't see people who were committing to transforming their lives into Christ likeness. Um, I couldn't see that great, that aspect of the great beauty of God, like really affecting our lives um, and living for the good and the true and the beautiful in our individual lives. And so that th sort of threw me like, what am I doing in this, you know, in this community? Um, why am I here? And so you see the bit of like an emotional doubt, the hurt that was there. Um, some of the things that I experienced in my own life, um, being sort of an academically minded woman and being marginalized for that in the church, um, that led to questioning my beliefs and my faith. And so that was when I started to look at, well, what are the arguments for God's existence? I was actually watching debates between like William Lane Craig and like physicists, things like that. And what moved me back towards belief was that as I was, I was actually actively searching to tear down Christianity because I, I um, liked my atheist friends better. I, I felt like the people that I had encountered before the church were in my opinion, I'm not trying to diss church communities. This is just my experience. Um, they were better people. And so I was trying to figure out what, do I have any reason to believe this? Um, and that's what happened to me is as I started looking at the evidence for God's existence, the evidence of the resurrection, the um, design in the universe, and beyond that, the reasoning for um, why we believe in things like good and evil, uh, the reasoning behind does go with me on this one, does my mind have access to external reality? <laughs> and I started saying, wow, um, when it comes down to it, having God as the foundation of the universe, this intelligent mind at the, as the source, the creator of this, all of this, that made sense to me. Uh, and that's what sort of turned the tide for me and brought me back around is um, I can't get past uh, God. I, uh, and I and I love that. I you know let me back up a minute as well. You know you talked about in your own background. Okay, being from the northwest part of the country and a little bit of what the I will say the the religious spirit or the faith um, ethos of that place would be as opposed to in the Bible Belt of the United States. Um, specifically, you were in Texas. It, just a just a practical question. Do you find with teenagers? Which group is, in your mind, with your contact with them, uh, and I don't have an answer for this. I mean, I have a thought about it, but which group is actually more difficult to, quote, unquote, crack or <laughs> to minister to? You know what I'm saying? So you've got these kids who are out there like you, your atheists, you talked about the, you know, your atheist friends and what they were like, and then you've got kids who, like me, were raised in the church and heard it from even back as far as they can remember anything at all consciously. Do you have a sense of that? Because I know a lot of times youth workers, they just lament those who are so tough to get through to, but they assume that one group is tougher than another. I don't know if you know what I'm asking. I guess I'm throwing you a softball here, but <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, that, I, yeah. I get you. I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, again, I, I don't have any studies on this, but in my experience, it's a different approach. Um, okay, that's good. Yeah. The, the problem for the problem I faced in the South with youth groups is the fact that they had been in church for you know 13 years, 14 or 15. So when they get to 18, they have this thought, like somebody who's walking away from the faith, faith has this thought that I know Christianity because um, I've been in it my whole life. And 
that that was problematic because the kinds of things that I encounter from former Christians, the kinds of arguments or what they believe Christianity is, is oftentimes so it's skewed. It's off. Um, it lacks a deep understanding of even basic doctrines of the Christian faith or in any understanding of Christian history. A lot of times that's they're completely void of uh, Christian history. Um, so that that's different from a student who has a nominal interaction with Christianity. Um, up in the Northwest, you deal with having no background in it or their background like mine was just what they saw on TV or what they get through social media now. Uh, so it's a very skewed version. Uh, and sometimes it's a very negative connotation. And I've done some breaking down of stereotypes saying, well, that, you know, that's, that's a stereotype of what a Christian is, but it's not entirely true because Christianity is such a large spectrum of people over time in history. So, um, but I also find that with Northwesterners um, and youth in particular, they're sometimes they're open to hearing because they haven't heard this uh, a million times. Every They weren't dragged off to church every Sunday and resent that, you know? So there's an openness to hearing this, our ideas and what we have to say. Mm, I like that. And you know, just just uh, as a youth worker, be, being open to the openness, could you say something about, uh, I don't know how easy it is to, you know, maybe explain some of the differences in approaches. I know you've talked a little bit about that, but when you're doing apologetics, how did you do it with a youth group in Texas or maybe a youth group here where we are in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, you know, the Bible Belt of Pennsylvania, as opposed to working with kids who have little or no knowledge, uh, maybe they're in the Pacific Northwest or anywhere, because those kids are everywhere. Yeah. Um, well, I'm doing a lot of the same work, honestly. It's um, bringing them up to speed on certain uh, issues within the Christian faith because they haven't had that yet. So if I teach a problem of evil talk and I introduce them to what the problem of evil is, it's probably going to be similar in the South as it is in the Northwest. Where it would be different is if, say, I'm speaking on a campus where the there's a lot more um, potential for protest or offense or things like that, then you have to adjust the language um, to make sure that you're heard before you're judged. Mm, that's a good way of saying that. Yeah, this is so good. We're going to take a break. Uh, we're talking to Mary Jo Sharp, and when we come back, I'm going to have her talk a little bit more about uh, the kinds of things, what she's written and this project, Dark Room, I want you to hear about that. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Hey there, Youth Culture Matters listeners. We've been told that one of our best-kept secrets here at CPYU is our one-minute daily podcast, Youth Culture Today. Each and every weekday, we release a new episode that's timely, practical, and hope-filled all for an audience of parents, youth workers, and anyone else who cares about kids. Here's a sample from one of our recent Youth Culture Today episodes. Youth Culture Today with Walt Mueller of the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. How do we help our kids discern good from evil in a world where increasingly we see what used to be called vices embraced as virtues and things that used to be virtues seen as vices? We are living in a world once described by cultural critic Gene Veith as a world where the only sin is to believe in sin. As parents, we must begin by teaching our kids the truths of God's Word. We must help them look carefully at God's borders and boundaries for our lives so that they might live into worshiping and glorifying Him by following His will and way for their lives. Second, we must teach them how culture twists our understanding of sin. In his book, Knowing Sin, Mark Jones says this, In our temptations, Satan wants us to call evil good and good evil. He clothes sin with the appearance of virtue. Greed is saving, lust is love, abortion is self-care, drunkenness is medication, and laziness is rest. Let's help our kids see all of life through the truth of God's Word. For more on youth culture, visit us on the web at cpyu.org. Youth workers, do your parents a favor and get them to subscribe to Youth Culture Today wherever they get their podcasts. Well, welcome back to Youth Culture Matters. We're having a conversation with Mary Jo Sharp about apologetics. Mary Jo's involved in a lot of writing. Uh, she's got some great resources out there in a new video series. I do want to mention that Chris Wagner will post on the show notes uh, underneath the player for this particular episode of Youth Culture Matters, which you can find 
on our homepage at cpyu.org, Chris will post links to everything that we mention here in our discussion today with Mary Jo, including uh, links where you can learn more about her books. And Mary Jo, I want to ask you about that. You've written uh, a few resources. Could you tell us about those and just who they're for and what they're about? So thank you for asking me about that. Um, Why I Still Believe is a book that I wrote for um, just conveying my own journey in sort of the deconstruction of my faith and then the return to belief in God and how apologetics drew me back the arguments. And it was, that one's very important to me because I'm not just giving you arguments, uh, which, you know, happens a lot where people say, here's a reason to believe in God. What I'm showing is not only is this a reason to believe in God, but here's how it affects me personally in my life and how it affected my interaction with others, including my family, you know, and um, everything around me, my community. So why I still believe you journey with me through, um, you know, the, the hurt and the pain that I experienced in the church and then how I came to terms um, with my belief. Uh, and then I've written, um, yeah, I've written several things. Why, why do you believe that? Another why book um, is a Bible study that you can do with a group at your church. And it's uh, like a six to seven week Bible study that introduces you to how to have better conversation on hard topics of the faith. Um, me, you know, for people who want to, to have these conversations, especially with, uh, people who are not Christians, it's a real, uh, introductory level apologetics type study that really can give them a good place to start having those conversations. So those are the two that I'd like to highlight. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, that, that, uh, second one, uh, you mentioned there, the study, is that directed towards a specific age group? Could youth workers use this? Yeah, I have had it used for um, youth groups, but I will say that it was originally written for women's ministries. So if you if you use that, there's a video series that goes with it that's available from Lifeway. Uh, so Lifeway Christian Resources. And uh, if you use the videos, just be warned, I'm talking to a group of women and it's directed at women. If you just use the study, the written material, um, you won't notice much of a difference. So it was targeted at adults in the church who want to have conversation about their faith, but it's written at a level that I've had youth groups use it as well. Yeah, and and I'm glad you said that because one of the things we've pushed here is, you know, I think way too many times we as parents, we as youth workers, we have a diminished view, you know, we, we uh, of the cognitive abilities of our high school students and even our middle school students. And so uh, we want to set the bar high and shoot high with them because they are curious about these things, obviously. And it's important for them to have the opportunity to learn from these. Let's talk about the video series, Dark Room. Uh, let's hear about how this came about and if you can explain to us uh, what folks will find when they access these videos, how to use them, um, just anything we need to know. Yeah, Dark Room is a um, project that was in the minds of um, our executive producers for a long time. Uh, they were wanting to bring something to students that was aesthetically excellent uh, to grab their attention and to hold it. Uh, that was something that would create curiosity and wonder about the God that we profess. And that wasn't preachy, but was more invitational. And so they've, they've really worked to do that, to uh, bring together um, a group of expert contributors and a world-class production company uh, called Ox Creates. I'd love for people to go check out Ox. They're doing a lot of great work. Um, they uh, they've brought us all together and they've produced these videos that are about eight to 10 minutes. Uh, and you, you know, you would play them at a youth group or you can watch them with your kid at home. And the, the whole thing, the series is entirely free. It's 14 parts and it comes with a free curriculum. So, um, PowerPoint. It comes with all the written materials, leader's guide, all of this sort of stuff to help you investigate some of these really hard questions. Uh, we cover, like I said, there's 14 topics that we cover. And what's really unique about these um, is that we did a call for Gen Z narratives, stories uh, across the country to bring real Gen Z student struggles and their wording about those struggles into the content that we created. So when you watch the videos, uh, sometimes the screenwriters translated directly from somebody's story and use their own words. Um, and so these are actually based in real life stories. It's not just a bunch of 
you know, Gen Xers <laughs> and older millennials and boomers going, hmm, I wonder what Gen Z is struggling with, or even reading studies about that. We're actually, we went to the students, we surveyed them, and then we combined their stories and um, used individual stories for these videos. So you're actually hearing from Gen Z what they're struggling with in the way they're struggling with it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome that that's the way you put that together. So I'm guessing as a boomer, you're not, I'm not going to hear the word groovy in there or uh, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, actually there was as even as Gen X myself, I was yeah. like, um, I wouldn't say this this way, but then I thought about it when the Gen Z would. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. That's, we're going to keep it, you know, yeah. as I'm reading through the scripts. <laughs> yeah. And I like how, I mean, it's kind of neat sort of in a circular way, how you, you take what they've given you and now you come back and you give it back to them in a sense and, and work to answer their questions that way. So uh, the videos, you said there's 14? Is that what you there said? There are 14. 14, yes. yeah. And they can be found at darkroomfaith.com. Yes, and thank you. We'll, <laughs> we'll include the link link for that. Um, would you re- just kind of run through, I think not all of them are out yet. Is that correct? They're coming out incrementally or how does yeah. that work? Yeah. So what topics are out now and what do we have to look forward to? Oh, yeah. So um, we have doubt out. Um, we have love, uh, the subject of church, which is real important to us. Like, what is the purpose of church? Why should we even go to church or meet? And um, the topic of sin. And these are all these are all like when you encounter these there, you'll see the topic uh, on the website. It'll say like church kind of small episode three church. But then the title is like Travis doesn't feel God. Um, sin is titled Sophie kills the vibe. Uh, and our latest one that just came out was on uh, the relationship of science and faith. Actually, I think I'm wrong. The latest one that came out was probably on religion. So yes. that, yeah, it's on religion. Laura so, hates Christians. Laura right. hates Christians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, those are the ones that you can access right now. And then we have some upcoming ones on suffering and on the Bible, as well as purpose and identity. Yeah, lots of issues that um, youth are struggling with. Yeah, so let me let me circle back. Uh, that one, Laura Hates Christians. I have not seen it, but I just read the descriptor of it. It says, uh, what's it say here? Lucia and her friends are disturbed by the Christianity that they see depicted in the media. Is that correct? Is that what I'm reading? Yeah. Is yes. this what Christianity is supposed to look like? She sets out to discover what type of Christian she wants to be and what, if anything, makes Christianity so special. So let me make an assumption here about this. Um, The way that Christians are depicted in the media, I think we're all sensitive to that. We're all aware of that right now. I'll just, I'll double back. Let me tell you a story from 40 years ago, because this is nothing new. I'm working, I'm in seminary, I'm working on a a fancy historic hotel on the north shore of Boston. Uh, There's about 140 employees in there, and I've developed relationships with most of them, and they feel freedom to come to me knowing that I am the only Christian on the whole staff, um, and they know this because I'm a seminary student, and so they have lots of questions. And th- this is how they would ask. Th- this is a question I receive multiple times, and this is what makes me think of this episode here because I want to dig deeper into it. They they would come to me and say on more than one occasion, uh, "Oh, so you're a Christian? What do you think of Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and Jim Baker?" Now I'm dating myself, right? But that's, <laughs> that's what their understanding of Christianity actually is. So I'm assuming that this particular episode, episode six, will work to help students navigate how that way of thinking about Christians as portrayed in the media, nuanced as it is now 40 years later in specific ways, will help spark discussions uh, to navigate that. Am I, am I on, on point there or yeah, Am I missing absolutely. The mark? And yeah. it's funny that you bring up the uh, trio of gentlemen you did, because that was my view of Christianity when I was growing up, like what I could see from televangelists yeah. and anybody that was yeah on TV. Did you work uh, at that hotel? <laughs> OK, right. I just want to be sure. I... <laughs> that wasn't me. We hadn't met before. <laughs> that was yeah. not me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that episode is really struggling through, um, you know, kids have immediate access to all sorts of videos on TikTok and Instagram reels and and. Uh, they, they do see a lot of things where it, you know, is disturbing to them. And they're concerned about the way that Christianity is portrayed, um, both from how we're portrayed and then from how we're portraying ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so 
Laura's friend, um, or Laura is the friend, Lucia is <laughs> dealing with this. She's trying to figure out how do I communicate that Christianity is valuable, good, and true when there's all this information that's easily accessible and it's influencing the minds of my friends who ask me, is this what Christianity is? And so Lucia is going through, well, you know, Christianity, where did it come from? What is it? Is it the white man's religion? Well, no, it's actually from the Middle East. You know, it's, it's not from uh, Europe. So she has to go back through and say, this is, this is what Christianity is. And, and can we just believe whatever we want to believe? And Lucia is like, yeah, that sounds nice, but she's struggling with that. I want that to be true. But in the end, and there's only one person that rose from the dead, right? That's Jesus Christ. And so she's struggling with the truth of that um, and having to bring that to her friend and telling her, you know, that Christianity welcomes everyone and has always been a very diverse and welcoming religion since its very inception. So, but, you know, that not ignoring that we have had mistakes in the past um, and big ones. So it's, it's helping students really place what is religion for are all religions just true? You know, what dealing with that religious relativism that's prevalent in the culture and being amped up by social media. Uh, and that's, that's really the benefit of, you know, Laura hates Christians. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 let me ask you this. Uh, so let, let's say I'm a parent and I'm, I'm in, you know, sitting in a family room with my kids and we watch this Laura hates Christians, you know, eight to 10 minutes, or I'm a youth pastor and I show this in the context of a small group or a youth group meeting. Once it ends, what happens then? What do you, I know you mentioned a little bit about you've given us some things to help us just not keep the question floating in the air without answers, but, you know, to really drive down, you know, as an apologist, obviously, and get us to the truth. So what kind of helps are there? What can we expect, like with this particular episode, you know, episode six, Laura Hates Christians, what can a, a youth worker or parent expect to be able to access to help them lead the discussion in, in in a good and redemptive direction. Sure. Yeah. So that's what the study materials are for. Uh, when you enter in your email to you know access all of this, uh, you get access to a leader guide and um, leader resources. So we're going to help you formulate you know how this is going to look like the steps to take during the actual event where you're going to show this, but then we're actually going to give you the background resources, probably a lot more information than you want, but it's going to be, um, you know, scripture and further resources, uh, websites, articles, and um, podcasts that you can go to. And they're, they're like all there available through our website for you to be able to, um, you know, guide this conversation and to help students think about what a, you know, Christian response would be to some of these issues. Um, so I, it's just so much material. It's so much content. And I mean, it even comes with a student guide for them. So it's, we try to make it as accessible as possible and as easy for you to just sort of plug and play it. Um, because we want you to have, um, we want you to be able to use these, uh, immediately and find them to be very effective and fruitful in your own ministries. Yeah. And what I like about it is you, you, you say plug and play, so it's easy, but you've also, it sounds to me like you've included an educational component for the parents and for the youth workers, which let me just say it's needed. You know, I say this all the time. We never stop learning. And I, I will say the older I get, the more I realize how much I don't know. I, I, I hope I know more than I ever knew before. Uh, but I, that also leads us to believe how much we don't know. And we're always learners. So that that's that's an awesome uh, side note to some of the benefits of this. Have you you know, these have been out long enough as you're getting, starting to get feedback on this. What are some of the win stories, you know, that you've heard? I mean, are, are students reading deeper? Are you finding, as I just said, that youth workers are, are reading more deeply? I'm sure you're getting feedback. Yeah. Um, we started getting feedback while we were still filming, like from the actors themselves and from the crew. Um, I remember one story about, uh, we have a lady that plays a director, and uh, she talked about how the response that she gives in the video was something that she wished she had had for her own children, her own, you know, growing up in the church. She wished that she had had access to this kind of uh, language to be able to help her kids navigate 
these cultural issues. And so we're already hearing about that. We're hearing about um, people saying that their student was watching the video, um, their child, and couldn't look away. Like they held their attention the whole time, which is quite an accomplishment in the current day we live in of like a minute or less quick videos. You know, sometimes TikTok videos oh, are only yeah. like 10 seconds, 30 seconds. So um, just the, the dual, like this, sort of like the aesthetics is moving them, but also the invitational co and um, content, the invitational content that we're do using um, come into this with us, you know, think about these things. That's actually drawing students into the conversation rather than off putting them at the start. And I think that that is such a good combination. Um, and that's what people are replying to us. This is really great. This is like you were mentioning, and I appreciate that, that this is excellent visual material, but then it comes with such uh, strong content as well. And it's, I think that's what, why we're getting the kind of responses like this is just what we need. Um, with youth ministers saying like, I've been waiting for something like this where it's, it's got that dual quality to it. Um, so those are the kinds of statements that I'm hearing as we start out, you know, this has been out since I think our first episode came out in May. So yeah, I, Those are the kinds but, of boy, you raise a good issue there about you use the word dual content and quality on both sides. And I know that sometimes when we get great marketing and great graphics, the content is quite questionable. And sometimes when we get good, good thinkers and theologians producing good curriculum with great content, um, the visuals, you know, the support materials are less than desirable, but to bring the two of them together, and that's why I was very excited about this. So, um, and by the way, just so everyone knows who's listening, we're not getting paid a penny uh, to promote this. I mean, it's just something that when we see something like this, we say, okay, this is good. People need to know about this. So, excellent. Well, let's take another break, and we'll be back, and we'll finish up our conversation talking about uh, Darkroom, which is a new video series which can be found at darkroomfaith.com. That's darkroomfaith.com. We'll be back in just a minute with Mary Jo Sharp. If you enjoy listening to Youth Culture Matters and would like to support the ongoing efforts of this ministry, you can do so by visiting cpyu.org giving to make a donation. Your prayers and financial support make this podcast possible. Well, as we hit this, this last little bit of our conversation with Mary Jo, uh, I, I want to ask her, you know, it, I always like those Joshua and Caleb moments where I talk to people who are working with students and have kind of wandered into the world of students and the land of students and just find out from them where they are. What are you seeing on the landscape that we really need to be concerned about? Can you come back and report to us, you know, what are some of the, <laughs> I don't know, giants, could we call them that, the giant issues that kids are dealing with that we have to be addressing in the church? We need to know about, we can't you know, stumble around on these things. We need to educate ourselves. We can't wait. There's some urgency here. What are some of those just big picture issues, topics, and maybe talk about some ways that you've learned uh, or some resources you're aware of, Mary Jo, that you can point us to that would, would answer some of these these uh, issues and questions? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, so, Obviously, with uh, our current society's cultural environment, um, love is a really important topic. Um, th the current cultural framing of love tends to draw too definitive of a line to sexuality uh, and not enough of a line to like the unconditional aspect of God's love or understanding the different kinds of love, you know, the phileo and erotic and all these different kinds. Um, so that love is an important one because our kids I, I feel like they're getting a bankrupt understanding of love. So that's, that's going to be one that we have to address because, um, you know, it's part of who God is, right? It's his nature. God is love. And we need to be able to make sure that kids understand that we don't just say some kind of phrase or soundbite, but that they actually have a uh, deep understanding of what that means and how that applies into their own personal lives and their daily living. Um, so that one, love, is something we have to address, um, a theology of love. The topic of church, uh, what is church for, the purpose of church, as 
as we see these high profile leaders come into uh, moral failure uh, in a very public way, it starts to, um, the, the Gen Z students are reporting more and more that they don't trust the institution of the church. Uh, and I think that's directly tied back to what they're seeing. So um, we need to help them understand the value of church community and how that relates over to, uh, again, apologetically, God is Trinity, right? So he is a community. And so that's important for us to communicate to our students that you're not meant to go it alone. Um, so yes, the church community is full of all the human vices out there, but um, we need each other. So this is an important subject, especially with the deconstruction movement going on in the current cultural moment. Uh, so love church. I would say the one that's not going to you know, change anytime soon is the subject of science and faith. That one has been around for a long time and it will continue to be around. Um, the right now the slogan science is real is becoming a very popular meme i see it all over the place and i hear it quite frequently and it tends to have a derogatory connotation towards religious belief so helping christians understand that the christian philosophical framework for science is robust consistent and coherent is quite a vital subject right now um, for our student education i would say for the body of christ um you know, just everybody needs to know this. So those are like some of the top yeah. ones. You, we, there's more, um, but those are that and the problem of pain and suffering. They constantly come up. Um, yeah. And Gen Z is affirming that in their their concerns as well. You know, as you're saying all this, and I, I'm thinking about how, you know, we've wandered on these things, not just culturally and the culture at large, but in the church as well. So you mentioned love, church, science, you know, a full understanding of that, and then suffering, which I want to ask you about in just a minute. Uh, it, it reminds me of the fact that, you know, I, I hear youth workers say, I'm not interested in teaching theology. Uh, I don't think doctrine is important. I just want my kids to come to know Jesus. And earlier on when we were talking, you know, you, you talked about a skewed understanding of Christianity, and we've talked on this podcast before that I think way too many times the church has untethered uh, separated justification from sanctification, and we just think, you know, get the get the get get out of hell free card and move on and live however however you want, satisfying yourself. You know, we've had Carl Truman on here talking about expressive individualism, and uh, that's been a big topic with us over the last few years. And you know, it's all about me, me, me. So um, again, I think this is where, and you you guys with Darkroom, you've done videos on all those topics you just mentioned and provided resources to help us understand how to answer these questions and how to get uh, the church and, and kids in the church back uh, to, to good thinking and good doctrine and really tethered to, grounded in, staked to the Word of God. You've got um, probably about around the time, maybe, maybe a little before or after this podcast episode drops, uh, you've got an episode coming out in Dark Room, it's episode seven on suffering. And I know you were the primary content creator for that. We've said here that one of the great needs in the church today, especially the North American church, is a good theology of suffering. We become extremely wimpy. We don't expect it. We want to avoid it. When in fact, when you read the Old Testament and you read the New Testament of what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus, suffering is involved. Can you talk a bit about that and why this particular episode is really, really important. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll first of all say that this particular episode um, is the one that sort of instigates the name for the series Darkroom, because our main character is, um, he discovers his uh, love of photography and, you know, he he's producing great works that give him a sense of purpose and meaning to his life in the dark room. And so that's sort of out of that, you would draw our metaphor for our whole series. But our main character is dealing with um, a circumstance of having suffered um, a physical a physical abuse while he was still in the womb um, as a baby. And he comes out with a, um, he has a mental disability in which 
it, it causes him to be the subject of bullying and, uh, you know, all sorts of problems in his youth. And so he gets to a point where he doesn't even know why he wants to live. And so what we're handling in that episode, um, which by the way, does come with a disclaimer at the front end on the, the level of the material that it's tough um, and people need to be aware of that, that um, he comes to, a, you know, this question of why, why did this all happen to me? I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask to be born. And so what we try to do in the episode is introduce students to both the theology of it, of suffering, and give some, um, you know, theodicy or defense about it. So we try to give them some meaty material to chew on. But then we also try to show the great compassion that God has for um, the suffering of mankind. And we make sure to note that he is not remote or removed from us, but that he's very close by um, and he understands our suffering, right, through Jesus Christ on the cross and that he's with us. So what does that mean for us individually? And you see how one student works that out in his own life um, about what he can do. So instead of focusing on the, um, he, he has this trauma, but what is he going to do with it? And I think that's really important for our kids to see um, that you can still be, have a meaningful life, that you do have purpose, that you do have value uh, no matter what your life has been or where you're at. And that's that's a real important part of the suffering episode. Mm, that sounds great. And, and I'm imagining now youth workers, as you're describing this, I mean, these are, these are tough issues. I, I would say, I think it's reasonable to say, correct me if I'm wrong, that a youth worker shouldn't just say, you know what, I'm going to show these videos and we're going to have a discussion. Because if all you do is show these videos and then you look at your students and you, because I've watched, right, and, and, and you, then you shut them down and you say, well, what do you think, right? Uh, all we're doing there is just sharing ignorance and feelings and opinions and things. And the question, I mean, that's not a bad question to ask, right? As long as you go on to the next question, which is, well, what should I be thinking? Or what should we be thinking about this? And this is where we dig into God's Word and, and talk about these tough issues. And as you talk, Mary Jo, about this particular episode about suffering, Max wants to end it all. Um, man, that's where, boy, theology and doctrine are just so, so important because there's not a kid in our youth group or in our world who is not going to face trials and difficulties and suffering. And the older we get, you know, the more we, we realize that. So we've got to dig down deep for that. This is so good. So uh, remind us again how folks can access these uh, particular videos as we finish up here. Yeah, go to darkroomfaith.com. And there's a, a place for you to put in your email to receive access to uh, the full materials that we have. Uh, once again, remember, this is all free. It has all been fundraised in advance, um, except for, <laughs> I say it's all been, we're still taking donations because we have to wrap up the last um, episode. Right. But so you can, you can also donate to this project if you're really um, impressed with it and feel that that's something you want to do. But it is all free access. You just need to put in your email to gain that access. And then, yeah, definitely go through. I said plug and play earlier, but um, you would definitely want to walk through some of these uh, videos and the content with maybe your leadership group or by yourself first. So you get a little bit of a grasp on, especially when you deal with like on the material, especially when you deal with suffering, right? Mm -hmm. This is going to be a hard one. You're going to have students who have thought about ending their lives. And so this is one that you do need to not just go, okay, I showed up and put it on, but actually think through it, read the material and come, um, with more of an understanding that this is probably better for like show the video, have the students get together in small groups and discuss some things and then come back together as the big group. But yeah, um, go to darkroomfaith.com, enter in your email and receive the access to uh, the materials. And, and your website, your personal website where folks can learn more about you, Mary Jo, that's yeah, my website's maryjosharp.com. And if you go to my resources, you can find a whole bunch of lectures and my own videos, other people's videos. Um, you can find all my books there. I've written several. And so just, yeah, use maryjosharp.com as a resource. Yeah, and I, I want to mention, I went there and I started scrolling through and I thought, man, some of this could go on a seminary syllabus. There's some great, great stuff here for folks. And so even if I would, I'll say this, even if students come to you with difficult questions that require, you know, a bit of a tutorial and some outside help that would, would help you develop uh, as an apologist, that this would, this is a great place to go. So 
uh, Mary Jo's website is a big one. I always end with this, Mary Jo. Uh, could you give a word to parents? Just as someone who does what you do and where you sit, and you're working with students, a word to parents and then a word to youth workers. And maybe it's the same word. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, you've got you've got this audience now. So uh, let, let them hear something from you. Well, I'm going to take a 30,000 foot level. Maybe I'll give it a lower one. But um, I'm hearing a lot of people feel despair or they are like, oh, you know, the, the way things are going. Um it's so tough. And so I always try to like send it back to the Chronicles of Narnia. Don't forget, even if we're in winter, that spring is coming, you know, Aslan has not forgotten Narnia. So um, always keep the, the hope of Christ ever present in your heart. Um, and then how do we do that? Well, practically speaking, the best thing that parents and, um, and youth workers can bring to the conversations that, you know, these videos are going to bring up is their own uh, constantly learning and transforming selves. Um, because when students see that you have your beliefs, but then you're also open to the fact that, you know, you're human and that you're prone to error, um, that so that you yourself are still learning and that you're willing to um, say, hey, I'm, I might have been wrong. That helps them open up to you and trust you and come alongside you in learning and partner in education. It helps them take responsibility for their own knowledge. So uh, those are the two things that I would say, you know, keep that hope alive, uh, no matter what it looks like, <laughs> spring is on its way. And um, also the, yeah, bring your own, uh, your mentorship in education that you yourself are a lifelong learner. Mm. That's a good word. It's a good word for me, right? You too, Chris. Chris Wagner, who's here do, doing all the recording for us. I, uh, I I thank you for this. Thank you for serving the church. Thank you for being a resource to to us as as parents. For me as a grandparent now, uh, for us as youth workers, and we're really looking forward to tracking with you, Mary Jo, and learning more about what you do as those more things come down the road. Uh, who knows? We st- we said in the beginning, what's next? Right now, you're a professor of apologetics, but. Uh, we look forward to what uh, God will be having you doing in the future. So thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me on. And again, we'll just say go to darkroomfaith.com. Great resources there. As Mary Jo said, we cannot emphasize this enough. This is quality stuff. We've seen it, and it is free. So uh, just do what you're told to do when you get to the website, right? Follow instructions. You'll have access to all these great materials. So Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Again, I remind you, go to the player at cpyu.org for this particular Youth Culture Matters episode. If you scroll down to the bottom, Chris Wagner will be putting and po- well, posting all of the links to everything that's mentioned, uh, been mentioned here today, and you'll find some great resources there. So thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Youth Culture Matters. Thanks for joining us for Youth Culture Matters, a podcast from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. If you'd like to learn more about today's youth culture, visit our website at cpyu.org. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, email us at podcast at cpyu.org.